All right. Praise God. And God bless everybody. And uh, this beautiful Monday evening that the Lord's made. And we're going to go ahead and jump right in and dig in deeper Bible study. Go to the Lord in prayer. Pray for our nation. Pray for the body of Christ. Uh, I really believe this is the most important election in modern history. You know, so uh, we really can't compare it to when this nation was founded, I don't think, but uh, it, it's very, very important. And we talked about several weeks back, vote for the lesser of two evils or who you, who you think would be best to, you know, pray about it and who God would lay on your heart. But uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us, Lord God. We thank you for all of your blessings, each and every one, Lord. We just pray that you anoint our eyes to see, our ears to hear, Lord, our hearts to be opened up and received tonight. We pray for a spirit of renewal and revival in our nation and our churches. We pray for our local church, all those that are sick and shut in, Lord God. Father, we pray for this election that you're, the person that you would have your will Lord, would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, uh, just anoint us as we minister tonight. We give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Oh, this is a little, don't just jump to the conclusion, conclusion that you know what I'm teaching about because I show you a picture because sometimes there's always, almost always going to be some kind of clue there, but you'll be fooled on this one for the time being. Water baptism. This Sunday, we're having water baptism, right? For some people that have received salvation and some people that have come back to the church. You know, uh, so it's important. But we're going to look a little bit at uh, some twist on it. So this is Digging Deeper Bible Study at the Lexington Church of God, and I'm Kelly Frady. So I got a question. Sometimes this comes up. Does water baptism save? You hear this from time to time, right? You know, and um, but I'm pretty sure that the thief on the cross that was in, the, in heaven with Jesus that day, I don't think he came down and got and uh, baptized but anyway the Lord did, uh, did give us the example and it is an important symbolic uh, thing that we should, would, should do and Matthew 28 19 says go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Does it? some people baptize in the name of Jesus some people baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Do you, does it matter? Both examples are in the New Testament, actually. So, you know. So God teaches us in patterns and parables. So that's a true statement. And and a lot of times, what I call patterns, they are types, right? And so God gives us a type. There's anti-types. But uh, it's, it's so, so very important to have a foundational knowledge of the scriptures. And you cannot move on to higher level math, you know, geometry, algebra, if you can't add and subtract and multiply, right? You got to have those basics down before you can go to a higher level or go deeper into math, so to speak. And for the very fact that math exists is a glory to God and shows how ordered everything actually is. So what I want to talk to you about tonight is the ark and the flood. And, and we start learning about this in children's church, you know, and what was the little Velcro stickers? You know, they put, they, they got the, the, 
the flannel graphs. So yeah, you know, and then our, the, all the animals, and you got the ark, and many many Christians have ark pictures and stuff like that at their house, and so it's just a, a beautiful type, and the Bible calls it an anti-type in some um, translations. So let's we're going to look at a few verses and then break this apart because. And this is by no means an exhaustive look. This is just touching, touching on it and bringing some stuff out. And we use this because Jesus used it, talking about Bible prophecy, as in the days of Noah. And, you know, we've used this many, many times and, broke, and unpacked that. So Hebrews 11, 7, by faith, Noah. Now, Hebrews 11 is, is the faith Hall of Fame, right? There's all, all kinds of famous people for their faith in there. But by faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. That's, that's important. There's a lot more stuff in there in that one verse right there than you realize. And is the archetype of Jesus? Yeah. We're going to look at that. But one, in reverence. So Sunday school was about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom and knowledge. And, you know, so that fear of the Lord is more and better defined as reverence for God. So why, why do we do what we do? One, out of reverence for, when I say reverence, that's because I know who God is and I believe God and I know that his word is coming to pass. So that impacts my life, you know, and he is our heavenly father. He's our holy father. And so Noah, out of fear of the Lord and reverence, and that's how he believed God, he obeyed God. You know, and because he did this, his family was saved. And we're here today. But by doing that, that verse says he condemned the world. There's a lot right there. So many times us living as Christians in this world and people don't always receive what thus saith the Lord and you know when we, if we witness to them we are also condemning the world by that. One thing that Jesus said and we, we're not getting into it so much tonight but he says you think I came to uh, bring peace and he said, no, I came to bring a sword and set every man at variance with his own family. You know, and he says, mothers and fathers and children and brothers and sisters. And, and how many have lost people in their family? All of us, right? And if you notice, there's a schism between mothers and your children and parents and grandparents. And, and if you're trying to live for Christ in this world, there, there's going to be, it's not going to mesh. It's always going to be grinding together because it's light and darkness and good and evil right there. Is Noah a type of Jesus? And these, This is basic, but I, I'm going to get it deeper for you just in a few moments. Here's some scriptures. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Could those things be said uh, true of Jesus? Yeah, right? I would, I would say absolutely. Jesus walked with God. And we've talked about that word generations right there and being perfect in his generations 
that's not talking about Noah was a perfect man. Only Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life, right? And But this was, he was still pure. He had a, an a, Adamic um, chromosomes and DNA, all right? He was still genetically pure from Adam. It's technically, literally what that says right there. And Jesus found grace in the eyes of, of, of the Father because he was obedient. Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Um, if you've listened to me over a period of time, you'll realize how dialed in God really is to stuff. And, and Sunday morning, I talked about the Fibonacci sequence and I had a picture of a sunflower and how God's signature is, is all over that. And God don't do anything by chance. Everything is ordered. Everything is directed. Everything is focused. With a laser beam. Now, because we live in a fallen world, and I said this Sunday morning, Everything is just a little bit out of kilter. And it was like gears on a gear. There's just enough, a little bit of play in the gears of the universe and life that it's, it's, it's just, it seems so ordered, but it leaves this tiny little bit of doubt that those that don't want to believe, they'll say, oh, it's, you know, I see a little bit of it, but this is chance. This is chaos. And, and this happened, you know, uh, there was a big bang and all of this happened. Yeah, yeah right. We're not going down that path. <laughs> How foolish is that? I mean, I would hate to go into eternity believing in something so foolish that a, a giant explosion caused everything that's so ordered in creation and, and God laughs he literally the Bible says that he laughs at them you know and, and God's got the last laugh so and then Genesis 7 1 said and then Noah said and then the Lord said to Noah enter the ark you and all your household for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time so, yes, Noah is a type of Jesus, very much so. Let's look in some New Testament scriptures. 2 Peter 2, 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. Now, that's a nugget. Was Jesus a preacher of righteousness? He was the way, the truth, and the life. He was the light of the world, right? I mean, he, uh, he is salvation. Everything about him and, and his mission that he accomplished. Uh, the Bible, how did Noah preach? We, we, we are not given any sermon. We don't, we don't know what he said, did he? But he had to spend a lot of that 120 years Preparing the ark because it was such a feat of, of, of building, you know, a masterpiece. That was uh, very complicated. And, and he had to follow God's direction. So is the ark a type of Christ? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and how many doors were there in the ark? One. What did Jesus say? I am the door. You see how, and, and even ark, when, when they were carrying the ark of the covenant around in the wilderness, I don't think it's by chance that that, actually what is an ark? Huh? Well, the one that they carried around, was it a boat? No, see, it was the ark too, but technically it's a coffin. Huh? 
bright, but in the when you think about that, his body as the ark, his body had to die, right? And we in him, we had to die to have spiritual life again. So in his death or in his the shell of his body, we receive salvation. Genesis 6, 16, put a door in the side of the ark. And there was only one way into the salvation that the ark provided. I'm, I'm sorry to have to notify you the, uh, of this, but it's not through Hinduism, it's not through Buddhism, it's not through uh, you know, Islam, it's not through science, it's not through Kabbalah, it's not through new age. And if that makes me narrow-minded or whatever, so be it. I love everybody, but there's only one way, okay? And that's through Jesus Christ and his shed blood and through the cross by faith. So God has only given one door, and he is that door. If you understand and, and I've talked about this recently about uh, God giving us the law of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth that Jesus was God's direct response to what happened. The devil's son, God's son. Okay? And if, if you... Um, I all very close went from the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane tonight. And what happened to the ground when God pronounced judgment? It was cursed, right? And what, what did it say it would bring up? Thorns and thistles. And so this is in a garden, right? And it says part of the curse is, and the whole earth is cursed. The ground is cursed. The ground is not going. We will have to what? what, what, what to eat, what's going to have to happen? By, by our toil and sweat. All right? So this wasn't like this before. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, by his, the sweat from his brow, he, he was under such tremendous pressure his, his great drops of blood, you know, and his mixed with his sweat was falling into the ground. So from the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then fully, you know, and he's on the cross, he said, it is finished. Jesus reversed the curse. That's, that's an important principle. So verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door. All that came before me are thieves and robbers and after him, right? But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and go out and shall find pasture. Now, if it was up to man to enter uh, through this door to find salvation, we can find encouragement from the fact that God himself would ensure, you know, that we would be safe and secure. Inside the ark, though it was rough while the storm was raging because they couldn't see out very well, but there was a slit of a window at the top, you know, that ran along the, the you know, and I'm sure it was under an eave of the ark, but that storm and... Um, it sounded like the worst storm that ever has been because it was. And, but they were safe and secure. I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little nugget. I showed you a picture. The very first picture and slide tonight was a picture of what? The disciples. They were 12 disciples in a boat. Jesus was in a boat. Jesus was sleeping. It was a storm, but he wasn't worried, right? He must be one of the heaviest sleepers I've ever seen. Right. But that 
is a beautiful picture of Noah in the ark with his family and us in the ark of Christ as the church and the storms of life. We can't always see out because there's only, you know, you know we see through a glass darkly, but we will see face to face. When, man, that is a beautiful type. Do y'all see that? How many of you have ever thought that Jesus on, sleeping on the boat is a type and a picture or the ark is an anti-type of that? Wow, that is, that's good stuff, you know. That was worth the price coming tonight just to see that. But, and and, and y'all go and take this stuff and run with it and study it. Uh, God, not Noah, God closed the door on the side of the ark. Wow. I've taught, taught that many times to the, to the boys and stuff way, way back 25 years ago. It, it was good stuff. So then the Lord shut him in. And so here is, is a beautiful, beautiful slide coming up. Get into the ark now. Soon it will be too late. How many people don't see that? Well, th that and the very fact that he's building the ark. See, we're building the church, right? And we're, we're God's tools and God's hands. And I'm working on the building. Y'all know that old uh, song, but even living his life is a, is a type of the book that they're reading. And they've made a, f a few movies to make poke fun at the ark, you know. That was a localized flood, and uh, what was the name of that one? Steve Carroll <laughs> grows a beard or something, and but it, huh? Yeah, and and you know, but in a way, I'm, I feel like Paul. That I'm glad they mentioned that story because God can use that and bring back to somebody's mind and that's still a way of preaching the gospel you know because they are acknowledging that that account in, in the word right there so now can we get a little tougher are you going to put your thinking caps, caps on uh, yeah. here's 1 Peter 3 18 through 22 for Christ also hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which, he, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. And we've talked about that before, how who were those? They were, that was all the people that died under the law, right? And that were in Abraham's bosom. And the reason why Jesus had to go to hell with, and smack the devil and take the keys he had to set the captives free because Satan had the title deed to this planet how did he get that because he, he his son was the firstborn son on this planet you know so y'all are all in the know here and you, and you get that but there's not a good explanation how Satan inherited this planet like that but that was the right of the firstborn right there. So here's, I got this verse highlighted. Which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is eight souls were saved by water. Notice they, it says they were saved by water right there. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Okay, now I ask you, did baptize, baptism save anybody? 
And we all said no. So this must be something else that that saying or referring to. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. This is where, you know, the little uh, idiosyncrasies of the, of the New Testament, you know, the, the scribes and the Pharisees saying the disciples, they were eating with what? And, and it, it didn't have anything to do with really getting your hands clean. Okay, cleanliness, uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. Benjamin Franklin said that, I believe, okay? It's not in the Bible, no. You know, and so he wasn't talking about taking a, taking a bath, right? He, he was not. And this is what that verse, that portion right there just said. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So that verse in yellow, I, I hit the parallel, uh, verse 20, let's look at it. Who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Now, the time we live in it says uh, many are called but few are chosen. It says wide is the way to what? Destruction. Broad is the way. Narrow is the path and the way that leads to life everlasting and few there be that find it there were potential multiplied millions and millions of people on the planet pre-flood right and so while he's building the he's obeying God because he was warned of something coming this is just a perfect mirror of today the Lord is telling us we're, we're building the ark, right? And the flood is coming. We, we done made the connection about 120 and 120 jubilees. We're at the end of the 120 jubilees, right? I mean, it's not coincidence. Everything that we expect to see, we see. Why? Because all these things converse upon the time we're living in right now. So, but who formerly were, this is the in New King James, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. See, God is waiting now, right? God says he's long-suffering and not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to a saving knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ. While the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat, only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. So now let's look at verse 21. Um, it's, that's not as complicated, all right? But the water representing something, the ark is representing something, Noah is represent, re, representing something, uh, Noah building the ark is representing something, and, and all these things are being presented right here. Verse 21, the one in yellow, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going we're gonna to dissect that in a different way, and you're going to see, hopefully your eyes will be opened up what God's talking about. And this is the nugget, more than a nugget. I mean, it's just like a a boulder right there for us to, to chew on. Here's that verse 21 in parallel verses. And corresponding to that, 
baptism now saves you. Now that verse is not incorrect. Do you, and we've talked about this before, but it's been about a year or so more back. But you know when it says there's one baptism and one Lord, that's not talking about water baptism. When we received Christ, we are baptized into his body. Y'all get that? We're baptized into Christ. And so that's the salvation that saves us. That's the baptism that saves us. You know, water baptism is just symbolic. All right? Right. Yeah. And then they came up with purgatory and to give, you know, ah, God can't, he's, you know, he's got to give us another chance. And, you know, so we can, we can, if we do enough penance, we can pray our, that's like, I guess it's the, the waiting door to get into hell, right? Or the compartment right before hell. And you, you're, you're in holding your numbers. You're, you, you ain't drawn the lottery ticket just yet. But, but if, if we all do good enough, we can get grandma out of there. I just don't, I don't see it, okay? Not, not in our canon of scripture and not in anything that I know of, I'm, you know, but that's between them and God. We, we love them too. And if they have by faith accepted Jesus Christ, they're just as saved as we are in the Pentecostal church. So corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt, not the mikvah, not the ritual baths that they would take or the ceremonial baths that they would take to cleanse their, the outside of their body. All of that was type and shadow and the, the sacrificing of the bullocks and all those things, you know, all that was pointing to Jesus Christ. But God had this thing lined out and, and he had it specified. And, and directed but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ see that's added at the end of that verse saying that's referring to that's that baptism that saves through believing in his resurrection this is also this is the uh, new King James there is also an antitype that which now saves us baptism not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How, how do you know that you're a child of God in the, in the New Testament? Huh? There's something after that I'm looking for, and, I, and it's stated a number of times in the New Testament. How do you know that you're, in the, even in uh, 1 John, you're talking about, he says, how do you, how can you tell, you're, you're, how do you know that you're a child of God? That, and the next thing, if you keep, if you obey what I say. Huh? That does qualify. Right? Because many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord. Have we not cast out devils in your name? Have we not healed the sick in your name? Have we not done all these wonderful things in your name, these works in your name? Nobody on the square, if, you know, I'm, and I don't, I'm not talking, I'm talking about, but sinners aren't doing things in, in the name of Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? They're not, there's no sinners so much going out casting demons out in the name of Jesus. There's not a lot of people doing that in the name of Jesus. This has to be somebody that's already named the name of Christ doing these things. Um, this is the NIV. And this water, talking about the water that the ark was running through, symbolizes baptism 
that now saves you. I, now I like that they put that word in there, okay? Symbolizes now saves you also, and not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here's the New Living Translation, uh, second edition. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. That's from living the life and, and being obedient to his, his uh, commandments. Now, I'm not talking about making mistakes and, and being, being human, but I'm talking about habitually you just breaking, you know, God's law. And how, does, how do you know that you're in a, If you have love for the brethren, if you love one another. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what brought it into power. So, thinking about this, and thinking about the Noah is a type, the ark is a type, and, you know, a lot of times what does um, water represent? in the Bible purification but in Revelation specifically what do the seas represent people right you know and let's look at this in Genesis 8 there's something I want y'all to get 8 1 through 4 and God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark, and God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep, and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained, and the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated, and the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. Do you see it? Huh? Okay, oh, look, I'm gonna give I'm giving you a hint. Y'all are on the right track. Wait a minute. Remember you the they changed, God changed the seventh month to what month? That's right. God changed the seventh month to the first month. No, that's the seventh month. This is now Nisan is the first month. You're, you're, you're on the right track. When, when is Passover? No, not Passover. What name those three spring feasts? Well, okay, we got first fruits. We got we got Passover. We got unleavened bread. How long did unleavened bread last for? And they were on the ark for how many days before the flood came? They were on the ark for seven days. Passover on the 14th of Nisan from the 10th to the 14th of Nisan they would bring in the lamb and they would you know check it out make sure it didn't have spot wrinkle or blemish on what day did Jesus come riding on a donkey into Jerusalem no the 10th right which is a week because we got to get to the um the 17th day of the seventh month, which is actually the 17th day of the first month, which is first fruits. But let's look at something. Wow! Are you telling me that the ark represents Jesus and, and his death and his coffin and that's the, there's the judgment and, and it represents the church I mean Noah is a type and 
So first, let's look at, look at this. And the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. Now, it, don't, it didn't say on the mountain of Ararat. But they were, he was several thousand feet down and it was on the mountains of Ararat. This has all been proven archaeologically, all right? But take a guess at what Ararat means. Now, if you just read it in the Strongs, it's going to say mountain, hill. But if you go to Brown Driver Briggs, Ararat means the curse reversed. Precipitation of the curse. Wow. Look, the mountain where Noah's ark came to rest. So the, the, the ark landed on at the spot where the curse was reversed. You think that's you think that's my chance? <laughs> that's God. Because, see, that's a type of Jesus. By Jesus dying on the cross, he fully reversed the curse. Now think how much how beautiful. That plays into me showing you about Golgotha and the place of the skull and then Genesis 3.15 and the cross being stuck right into the head, into the skull and the tight of the other line, the Nephilim, the fallen ones, right? And man, that is, that is just good, good, good stuff right there. So, and the ark rested on the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month. Let's look at this for a moment. So the 17th of Nisan, the first month in the religious calendar, is, is all kinds of stuff associated with it. One, Noah's ark comes through the waters and rests on the earth for the first time, bringing new life to Noah and his family on the 17th of Nisan. The feast of first fruits, symbolizing new, new life, would occur on the first Sunday, right, after Passover. Wow. Jesus reversed the curse. See, if you understand the Old Testament and you as a Jewish rabbinical student your whole life, e immediately these pictures would just open up. Wow. See, everything God does is ordered. These feasts that I've been teaching you about for years are so very, we don't even, and I told you, you don't even have to call them feasts. These divinely appointed dates that God has set in history. The devil wants you to grasp this concept called Easter. And that's totally got you off, the, down the wrong path because that's the pagan misrepresent. That's like a, a horoscope to, uh, you know, God's message in the stars. You see how that's apples and oranges or uh, apples and prunes or something. I mean, it's, it's not even talking about the same thing. Israel came through the Red Sea and on the 17th of Nisan, having left at Passover, remember how many days journey was it? Three days journey there, bam. They're growing, going through the Red Sea. Do you see how that represents salvation? They're leaving their life of bondage. When we receive salvation, we're saying goodbye to our old man. Goodbye to the old life. Hello, new life in Christ, living life in the Spirit. Whew, I mean, that's, that's such good stuff. Um, so, when the Egyptians drowning, that was a picture. 
the old life drowning right there. The manna which had been fed the nation of Israel for 40 years. Now 40 is the number of what? Huh? Well, no, not complete. That's seven. 40 is the number for judgment, right? Remember, they spied the, the promised land for 40 days and God transferred that into 40 years. 40 is a time of, of God's divine judgment right there. So on the 16th of Nisan, they, they didn't eat manna anymore. It was first fruits. So how many, which of you get the ark is a picture of what? It's one of the, those spring feasts directly. If everything that was destroyed was infected with leaven, the ark is a picture of unleavened bread. Wasn't Jesus' body unleavened? Huh? He lived perfect, right? He was born of the woman, of the seed of the woman right there. He was unleavened. So the, um, the death sentence over the entire Israelite nation as their sworn enemy, Haman, the judgment was supposed to come and they signed a decree to destroy them. The decree went out on the, thir on the 13th of Nisan and Esther then proclaimed a three-day fast for the 14th, 15th, and 16th. And on the third day, Esther approached the king saying to herself, if I perish, I perish. An attitude of death or resurrection. And it's in God's hands on the 17th of Nisan, the tables were turned on the enemy Haman and instead of the Jews being destroyed, he was destroyed. See, at the cross, Jesus, when he said, it is finished, he reversed the curse from the garden. It's amazing to be in church our whole lives and never have to ever know stuff, certain little things like that. Brother, if the King James Version was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. I hurt somebody's feelings, but I didn't mean to. That's, that's actually a, a good uh, summation of, of us. And I did some teaching, I preached the sermon at the church where God had us at before bringing us back home here and it was called the Americanized Jesus and Tanya wants me to keep the, she's kept on and on and on and on you need to do the Americanized Jesus it would blow your mind how we have this perfectly white Jesus in our mind I'm not saying he, he was black I'm not saying he was, he was brown okay he was Middle Eastern Right, he was olive skin. Um, but we've got this idea of how we think Jesus looks towards everybody and treats everybody. And, and so sometime, and especially in the past, the church had an air of, hey, you're better than somebody else in a lot of ways. But nothing is further from the truth. And we were wrong in that. We need to repent of that concept and that spirit. But... Don't Americanize the Bible either, right? Because you won't, you will not interpret. You do have to go back with a Jewish mindset and try to read it with Jewish eyes and through the Holy Spirit. You know, there's a lot of things they don't get, but we don't need to build our own little box, our own little preconceived theological box that just because you heard something your whole entire life don't mean everything inside that box is right. No. And, and, and neither were a lot of other 
cultures that lasted a long, lot longer than, than we've lasted. You know? Right. All right. And, and, all, and we're getting crumbs from the table. And because we were raised, even if we were raised in the southern church, right? And I'm, I'm talking about the Bible Belt, not meaning that derogatory towards any geographical area. But, you know, it was church and, and Sunday school and apple pie for some of us, right? All right, look, I got a few more slides. This is just too good to pass up. I mean, hopefully your eyes were just blown away. Um, and, and then we had our encore song by, uh, who sings that song? Who sings Sweet Caroline? <laughs> Neil Diamond, oh yeah. So. <laughs> All right. Yeah, let, let me wrap this thing up. I'm glad that we can have a laugh in Jesus' name, you know. And, but there's only one ark and only one door. That's Jesus, my friends. And when, when the door was shut, there was no second chance. When this door is shut, there's nobody going to be saved that's going to be in the first load anymore. You, there will be a second load, but you will have to suffer and be tortured and give your life. But we've talked about this before. I don't think those groups are ever like the same exact. One says these, this group, that, and, and there's a group below the altar, and the angel says, you know who these are. And, you know, John the Revelator's like, no, nah, you tell me. You know, you, he didn't want to answer any questions on his own. And so he says, these are they that came out of great tribulation. And it says they are ever before the face or the presence of the Lord. And he wiped every tear from their eye. You know, and it's like that's his own personal choir. I can't answer the question whether they will rule and reign for a thousand years or they're always in this, you know, and they're just praising God through eternity or something. You know, that's something you... Yeah. No, there, there is a different, see, everybody thinks you're just automatically, if you, if you miss the first load, well, I'll die for what I believe in. If you can't live for what you say you believe in now, don't, don't think you can die for what you, die for it, you know. I, I, I wouldn't want to leave it to that chance. The ark is a type of Jesus Christ, the ark of our salvation. The ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month, Upon the mountains of Ararat. Wow, where he reversed the curse. Jesus was resurrected on the 17th of Nisan. Where he reversed the curse. Noah's new beginning on the planet Earth was on the anniversary in anticipation of our new beginning in Christ. Wow, I, like, that's just, that's just it's mind blowing. Mind blowing how good that is. And the ark came to rest on the, upon the mountains of Ararat. The long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, entering into which a few, that is eight souls, were brought safely through by water. Which water, as the antitype, also now saves you? That is baptism. That's the baptism into the salvation that Jesus Christ offers. It's, it's, and I'm, that's my. Uh, paraphrase and interpretation right there so at the cross this is a great slide we're crucified with him pastor this right here is just a beautiful slide and see so uh, going under the water we're being buried with him in a sense they were buried in the ark right but, but they were going to have new life on the very day that we, see, when we come up out of the water, and, that, and the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat, 
where the curse was precipitated, the curse was reversed, and it is finished. That's, that's just good stuff. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. Oh, what does baptism symbolize? When a person is physically born, water, amniotic fluid, comes out from the mother's womb with the baby. Because water is involved in baptism, the sacrament symbolizes a new birth for the person being baptized. And it's symbolic, right? And, and so, bam, we're coming out of the womb right there. Because Jesus was also baptized, our baptism links us to him through his baptism. We do not believe in transubstantiation. We've talked about this before. What is that? When we take communion, we do not believe that that grape juice and that wafer literally becomes the body and the blood of, of our Savior, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That don't make us cannibals. Well, this symbolically links us and connects us to him, saying we, by faith, you know, believe in his shed body and his shed blood and the resurrecting and encoupling power that comes with that. And, you know, people get so mixed up on this stuff a lot of times. But we're then linked to everything he ever did for us, including his resurrection from the dead. So baptism also is a symbol that we should live a new life. This is where the old man fights against the new man. This is, this is where the rubber meets the road and where we live and where we, we have to win this battle right here of, of living a victorious life. So it's completely different than before we, when we were baptized. And we need teachers and ministers and fatherly and motherly and grandfatherly and grandmotherly examples and uh, you know parents and just people that will be a good influence in the church in a sense you don't raise your children it takes the church to raise your children uh, that's a joke I mean that's true and I believe that but Obama said we don't, we don't raise our children right it takes a village to raise your children Hillary I believe Obama said something like that too okay but listen in God's perfect world, our children would be raised up to have faith in the church and the, what we teach them. That's why it's so important. We should teach the truth. <laughs> All right. So baptism is not what saves you. It is simply an outward expression of the inward commitment that has been made to God. It's going public with our faith. Right? It's a symbol, a reminder of this commitment as we journey in our relationship with God. It's a conscious, de conscience, conscious decision that is made by the believer after they have committed their life to Christ. It's not a decision that someone else can make for you, but one that is made as a public confession of faith. This is why I always won't like for people to testify because we're to, you know, that we're to confess with our mouth. Before and, and if you just go ahead and do it, then it's easier to do the next time. And hey, I'm not ashamed. We believe in full immersion, water baptism, because we see in Scripture that is the example that Jesus gave us when he was baptized. Oh, so, there's the picture. Look, he was asleep, but he woke up. He wasn't afraid. And that is just a beautiful picture of the ark with the believers and us in the body of Christ, the ark of Christ. God bless you. And does anybody have any comments or anything you want to add? Go home and study some more about those dates if you want to and look up all those accounts. And all those were patterns and types leading us to the real type. Even, even the real type, Jesus we still have a fulfillment of that 
when we receive our glorified body. Right? It still continues on. So God bless you.